Hello, everybody, and welcome to another awesome episode of Ignite Radio Live. You are with Greg and Stephanie Schleter over the five mighty stations of Annunciation Radio for the Almighty and praise Him that we have this opportunity for such a time as this. So we have a very special guest. You've uh, heard him before on our airwaves, Eric Sammons. And the short backstory, if you will, is uh, we're blessed to have known Eric at Miami of Ohio at the time that uh, he was just a pagan, anti-Catholic Christian. (laughs) I'm kidding. He was a very, though, committed Christian, not Catholic, very close to my brother Nathan and a number of others, and particularly in the fertile ground of the pro-life movement was the occasion of intellectual formation. I would say those who are connected with us, uh, where he met his wife also, and uh, just has a range of tremendous gifts that following college, he really um, found himself actually later in college into the Catholic faith and um, has worked for various dioceses in significant ways. He's old, owned. Um, <laughs> and old, maybe. Pro- probably. <laughs> Feeling it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh uh, various companies, and most notably, he's a husband, father of six wonderful children. Hopefully, I got that right. Did I get that right, Eric? No, seven. Like I said, seven awesome children. <laughs> seven or maybe number. six, okay. and one is still in question yeah, for the awesomeness, yes, right. depending upon the day. How old are your kids now? The oldest just turned 24. Uh, she's living down in Dallas, graduated from the University of Dallas, and now has a job down there. And Doing what? Is she, is, uh, she is an art major, and so she works for an art framing shop. It also has a little gallery with it as well. So I can't believe an art major got a job in her field, but she did it. Uh, Yeah. So yeah, she's doing well down there. And I got two at Steubenville. Peter, my son is going to go to Steubenville in the fall. So I'll have three there because my oldest is graduating, but she's doing the four plus one psychology. So she has one more year. So I'll have three at Steubenville next year. And then I got three, I'll have three at home uh, with the youngest being uh, five. That's awesome. Um, Bernie, my dad, refers to the younger three at home as leftovers. So it's kind of humorous. (laughs) They're actually uh, endeared with that. They They do. Um, We've actually become a, we've actually become a Hillsdale family, of course, not just with Nathan, just huge fans. John Paul doing a great job there. And Catherine just admitted. So first (laughs) folks, I, I I don't want to miss the opportunity to direct you to ericsammons.com, E R I C S A M M O N S dot com. And uh, you kind of see the banner, what he's about, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Holiness. You'll see a number of books that he has written addressing a variety of topics. And uh, he is also head of the Saragossa Group, which is a small independent company focused on writing, editing, coding, and publishing. And most notably, cue the crowd, applause. He is recently named the editor-in-chief of the Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com, which is a voice for the faithful Catholic lady, founded in 1982, and uh, continuing to be that voice of truth in a generation, a compass uh, in a wilderness of often confusion. So for all of that, I'm sure I've missed other things, but Eric, so glad to have you back on the program with us. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and it's great to be here. I just want to make sure everybody who's listening knows Greg is one of the primary reasons I'm Catholic for <laughs> event. He got me into the pro-life movement because he was friends with my sister, and that got me into the pro-life movement, which got me to meet different Catholics, including his brother, and eventually led me down the path. So it's all your fault, Greg. Oh, yeah. goodness. I'm very humble. So when you Small get any seat. hate mail, you can just forward it to Greg to add to his. <laughs> I'll gladly, gladly receive it. So, Eric, we want to have a consequential conversation because you definitely are one whom I think are among the few who recognize the wilderness that we are in. And by we, I certainly mean uh, Catholics, but I do mean we believe the fullness of truth that is applicable to every human person, whether they recognize it or not. So you, you look through that lens, as Frank Sheed would say, to see the world sanely, is to see it God-bathed. And uh, whether it be your social media, your articles, you get it. And, and you also have a heart, which I think is most significant for Catholics today, to uh, what is deficient, what is in need, and how do we respond? You have great insight. You've written about it. You've addressed that. Before we go, quote-unquote, there, tell us about the coming into Crisis Magazine. How did that happen? Yeah, it, it actually happened somewhat suddenly. I, I've for a number of years now, I've been uh, working for myself, uh, independent writer, editor, um, and it's been very nice. Work from home, able to spend a lot of time with my family. We homeschool, so we have, you know, I'm around my kids a lot. It's great. I had no desire to change that, but then uh, crisis, they, they reached out to me, 
and uh, said they, they, they needed a new editor in chief and wonder if I was interested. Uh, I guess I've written some articles for them before and they thought it was a, they, they, their audience seemed to connect to those mm-hmm. articles. And so I thought about it and uh, I, you know, I talked to my wife, prayed about it. And I thought it was a great opportunity because I really, I've always been a supporter of crisis as long as I can remember. I, you mentioned they've been around since 1982. Uh, I became captain in the 90s, and I remember Crisis, mm-hmm. an actual physical magazine in the 90s, um, and I thought it was great then, and you know, I think it's done great work. So uh, I'm just trying to kind of carry the torch of my predecessors who did such a great job. That's fabulous. So, folks, go to crisismagazine.com, and let's help support the great work that Eric and others are trying to do in being that beacon of truth. And uh, I would say has the courage to address the edgy, difficult, challenging things that, uh, you know, we want to have a humility to the fullness of truth. None of us are saints. We profess this truth. This is kind of a key theme. Those of you who've been around Steph and I long enough, we, want, we profess a truth, but are we living it? Are we uh, being formed by it? It's easy to profess it, right? But are we actually being forged in it? My mind was drawn to Stephen Covey sort of unpacking the name crisis with those two images, the the Chinese images that basically the word crisis is comprised of those two images, which mean respectively danger and opportunity. And I think it's a really a great way for us to look at the world today. And I'm going to kind of ask you in a second to Paint the picture from that sort of Frank Sheed looking at the world sanely as to see it God bathed to give us your perspective of what you see playing out over the last four or five years, uh, punctuated by this recent election, what's going on. Before we go there, just some fun lightning round questions. Can you say President Biden? Ouch. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I say President Biden. Oh, he did it. Okay, impressive. That's very magnanimous of you. Yeah, um, yes. Can you say Biden? is a good Catholic. Uh, I can say, I can add a word to that and say it. Biden's not a good Catholic. That's good. That's a start. Yes. So I want to propose also as we consider the nature of this culture and crisis, that at the heart of that crisis is redignifying words such as Catholic. If it's not actually representing what it what it professes to be, then all of those who are languishing, who are impoverished, pining for truth, for which the Catholic Church, Christ through his Catholic Church is the supply, are going to be left languishing. So in this conversation, folks, I just feel moved right out of the gates that we would have a humility and really considering the words we're familiar with that we profess all the time and just say, you know, Lord, awaken me all the more fully to what it means, not just to know this in my head, but to really live it. What does it mean to be a good Catholic? Because it's easy for us to sit back, and certainly we ought to recognize the gravity of Biden's support of killing unborn children in the womb through nine months of pregnancy and beyond uh, at our expense. Huge uh, implications. Hitler was not remembered for a great economy. Um, these are consequential things. But we ought to look in the mirror. We want to look in the mirror tonight as we talk to Eric. You know, are we attending to the full inheritance appointing and anointing that God has for us as Catholics? Let's be availed to that because uh, the answer to the challenge, um, if you will, is, is going to be us. So, Eric, here we go. Zoom out for us if you will, and sort of looking at the last four years, the tumult, the politics, and might I say also the ecclesia, ecclesial situation, what are the key themes of what's going on there? The history according to Eric Sammons, right here, folks. Well, we'll keep it, uh, we'll keep it focused to America, and we'll keep it focused, as you mentioned, to the last, let's say, four years. I think a couple things. Obviously, the, the first thing people think of when they hear the last four years is, is uh, Donald Trump. Actually, for me, the first thing I think of is uh, former Cardinal McCarrick. Mm. Uh, I feel like that was a tipping point, a crisis point, if you will, uh, in which many things that had been hidden were revealed in, mm. in the Cardinal McCarrick scandal, and that they had been they had been percolating, they had been showing up a little bit here and there, and people were suppressing them inside the church, mm-hmm. and then it all came out to the light. I tell people, uh, and I say this uh, just admittedly, that I was radicalized by the the, McCarrick, the summer of McCarrick in 2018. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, obviously, before that, I've been a practicing Catholic for years. I try to take my faith very seriously and live it out. But I tried to do it uh, in a way that was just the, the, the status quo way that we mm-hmm. all, all of us Catholics kind of do it. And I realized that leads to McCarrick. 
Mm. It leads to the evil that we see there. And, and it made me realize we have to stop playing games. We have to stop uh, just going through the motions as Catholics and accepting things as they as that go. And here, let me just give one example, which I think some people, a lot of people will uh, recognize and may not even like my implications of it. But just think about your standard Catholic parish, what it's, I'm talking pre-COVID at this point, what it's like. You have uh, bland liturgies, bland music, bland uh, architecture. Mm-hmm. Everything is bland. It, you just and and people go through the motions. They show mm-hmm. up. And you know, I'm not I'm not judging every person or anything like that. I'm just saying the way it feels. If I walk in there, I always try to. I do this a lot. I don't know why I'm weird. Um, <laughs> I, I imagine walking into a parish for the first time as somebody who's not Catholic and maybe doesn't know what Catholicism. Maybe I'm an alien from Mars or something. <laughs> What would I think? Mm-hmm. And when I walk into most parishes, I think what I think is these people do not, they, they don't take this seriously. Whereas when I walk, if I walk into, let's say, a, uh, 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 let me try to think, something like maybe even a, um, a mosque, I would say these people take this seriously. Mm-hmm. And that is an indictment against, against Catholics uh, today. And I'm not talking just, it's easy to blame the bishops, and I'm happy to do that too. <laughs> but I'm talking from every, from the top to the bottom. Right. We all just go, are going through the motions, That's the great. status quo of what the church is. And I feel like, for me at least, and I've talked to a lot of people, this is anecdotal, but I've talked to a lot of people who have the same feelings, that McCarrick kind of opened their eyes that, like, this just doesn't work. What we're doing doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And so we have to get ourselves outside of that and ask uncomfortable questions. Mm-hmm. Questions that that make us recognize maybe the way we do things isn't right. So maybe the way we, we worship at Mass isn't the way it should be done. Maybe the way we uh, invite people in, may, maybe our attitude towards welcoming is an example of maybe that's not the maybe that's the Christ-like way. I, I wrote a whole book, The Old Evangelization, mm-hmm. and it was how to uh, share spread the faith like Jesus did. And one of the things I try to make clear there is that all of our ideas of evangelization, they are very much guided today by modern ideas, and they're not guided necessarily by the way Jesus did things. Mm-hmm. If you read the Gospels over and over and over again, the image you get of Jesus is not the kind 1960s hippie mm-hmm. uh, preaching tolerance and, and, you know, let's give everybody a hug. In fact, he comes across Frank—I love how you bring Frank Sheed. He's one of my favorites, too. In his book, To Know Christ Jesus, he really makes it clear that if you read the Gospels and you look at the portrait of Jesus, he does not come across as a quote-unquote nice guy. Mm-hmm. He comes across as somebody who is very firm. He's very direct. He does not give praise lightly, unlike every Catholic church I've ever been to. They they can't help but praise themselves and the diocese and what vibrant parish they are and stuff like that. Jesus does not give praise lightly. And he does, he's not as welcoming as we like to think. I mean, we all know the, the story of uh, when he revealed the the, the the true presence of the Eucharist in, in John 6, and a lot of people left, and he, he didn't say, oh, no, you're still welcome. He just let them leave. Mm-hmm. So all these things kind of, I know that's a lot, but that that's kind of what I see we are, that I think there's been a shift since McCarrick that has allowed a lot of people, uh, myself included, to see that we need to really go down deeper to the roots of our issues in the church rather than just the surface of, oh, we need this new program or something like Fabulous. that. It's more than just a program. Just a quick interjection to um, after your book came out, we did have you on Ignite Radio Live um, to talk about that awesome book, The Old Evangelization. So in our show notes, let's make sure to put the link for any of you listeners who would um, like to hear that because you explain it so well and just give a real taste of uh, truth and kind of a a charge of excitement to like, let's dive in and do it the right way. So Revelations 3.14 speaks of the community of Laodicea, where Christ recognizes the extraordinary comfort, very similar to, to America today. And he recognizes that they are comprised of hot or cold. And he speaks those words that we all ought to heed, because it's the result of those who inadvertently worship comforts in the name of the comforter. Be ye therefore hot or cold, lest I spit you from my mouth. So I want to throw this at you. Do you see an opportunity 
in what seems to be systems and comforts, uh, systems of comfort kind of collapsing? Do you see opportunities there of God, maybe the Holy Spirit working in there to maybe bring us back to our foundational awareness of who we are and radical reliance on Christ, or am I being a bit too optimistic? No, I think you're right. Uh, Before I go on, I just have to say this, that this totally triggered a memory of me of you in college talking (laughs) about that passage from Revelation like 30 years ago. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Are you twitching? You're still still saying it. That's great. But no, I just remember that you talking about that passage of Revelation, the the church of Laodicea, and neither hot nor cold. But anyway, okay, I will go on. (laughs) That's great. That's great. (laughs) We won't have the old home week here, but we'll just, I just thought it was funny when you said that. I was like, oh my gosh, I totally remember him talking about that back in in college. Old evangelization, Eric. Old evangelization. And since Greg and I are old, you know. Indeed, <laughs> getting there. Exactly. Go ahead. You know, what you're saying is true, though. I I feel like a lot of things are being revealed. And I said that with McCarrick. I also think, uh, just to try to get some more controversial topics, I think the response to COVID is a big thing, too. Hmm. I think the way the church has responded to COVID, in my personal opinion, has been on a whole very bad. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, what I my, my main criticism is is that the church has not seen itself as an essential to to who we are as humans. That that the, the liturgy and the, the sacraments and, and, and general prayer community are are not extraneous things. And and so I feel like what's happened is, is I, I just heard a story the other day of a, a friend who was at a mass was visiting uh, traveling or something like that went to mass. Um, this was just a few weeks ago, and she didn't have a mask on, and the, and the priest stopped his homily, pointed her out, and said, if you don't put, you know, put a mask on, you have to leave. I'm not going to go on until you do wow. You're not going to take communion unless you do. And it was just a such a terrible witness to everything. I mean, I, you know, I'm not even saying there aren't some prudential um, mm-hmm. things that need to be done in response. I'm not, I'm not claiming that. What I am saying, though, is that there has been an imbalance in how we uh, view the physical and the spiritual. But I think what that's done, though, is it's revealed things. Like, I know a lot of people who are, and uh, sadly, it's revealed things in some ways. For example, I wrote an article recently about the fact that the, the mass attendance has just plummeted even mm-hmm. more from the mm-hmm. And can we weekly. recover? Yeah, and can we recover? We were at 20% weekly uh Catholics going to mass before COVID, we're at about five to ten percent now, mm-hmm. and and that's even after the lockdowns have been opened up in most places. And people, you know, I know there are places where people can't go, but in general, most people in America can go to some type form of mass now. And just a large, ninety five percent of them aren't going, and and I think that's revealing something. Now, why people aren't going is various reasons, but I do think there's a decent chance that a, a good percentage of the ones who are no longer going. They were going out of a sense of just, that's just what we do. Mm, obligation. And the habit, and it wasn't really, yeah, it wasn't really a, a deep faith that like, okay, the Mass is the most important thing. It's the source and summit of my faith and things like that. And and I'm not pointing the finger at them. I'm pointing the finger at us, at the Church, that we that they didn't see that before, before COVID. And so what COVID has done is just revealed something that was already there. It's not like the people who stopped going mm-hmm. beforehand were necessarily they didn't really necessarily understand beforehand so yeah the revelation of 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 things right now like where people stand i think is accelerating things like i do think things like the the presidency of donald trump now with with the supposedly second catholic president now with joe biden with mccarrick with COVID, all these things i feel like there's an acceleration going on i think you know you know for years now we've all kind of felt it moving in this direction but it's almost like now it just really picked up speed. Eric, is a that's so good. As a um, former non-Catholic who, through good, beautiful, true, and one, were captured by uh, by the by Catholicism, I saw a neat picture of you with Scott Hahn and others recently. You had some special time with him, uh, one of our dear friends. Anyways, um, you you crossed the Rubicon. You came into the Catholic faith. You had experience with the dynamism, shall we say, that some experience, whether it be Campus Crusade or those things, which I must punctuate, and we know this is as Augustine would say, all that is true is 
those hours, um, all that is, you know, authentic. God wants to capture the totality of the human person. But something brought you into the Catholic faith. And speaking with that, maybe memory, speak to those Catholics right now for a moment. Put on your sort of Catholic evangelical hat. You know, speak to those who are not going to Mass right now. You know, why should they? Why bother? Yeah, it's a great question, and I, I ultimately one of the primary reasons I became Catholic is because I did recognize that Jesus Christ Himself is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. Mm-hmm. And if you if you truly believe that, if you recognize that fact that Jesus Christ, you, you know, have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, as, as we said as evangelicals, there can it can be no more personal than than receiving Him in Holy Communion. And so that becomes really the, the center of your faith life. I remember during lockdowns when, when the church, you know, last year when the churches were closed, it was such a struggle for, for many of us to be denied being mm-hmm. able to go to Mass. But it helped us to recognize how important it was, too, mm-hmm. and, and how important that is and, and what we will do for it. And I think that, that those who are not going to Mass, first of all, I, I completely, um, I, I don't want to say I understand, but I empathize, and I, I sympathize, and I know it's hard, and I know there's uh, many parishes I, I do that, that have a lot of very strict rules that are difficult to mm-hmm. sit through and, and be with. And I would say, and, and this isn't the, 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 the correct answer by, by diocesan standards, but I would say find a parish that you know you can find where, where you can uh, go and not feel like you're you're treated as just a a, um, a vector of contagion. <laughs> that is so well put, Eric. Oh my gosh, my heart vector just leapt. Vector of contagion. The, the new, next so new true, title of his though. article. It's so true. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead, we, Steph. I, so, I, I had a, cue soapbox, Steph. No, gosh, don't get me going. Don't even get me going. But a, a friend recently told me that her priest um, said before distributing communion, if you feel, quote unquote, that you need to put your personal piety against my pers- over my personal safety, then go to the end of the line to receive communion on the tongue. I mean, that's so think wrong. History, think about the history of our church and what priests have endured and what they have, mm-hmm. uh, put, the dangers they have put themselves in in order to bring Holy Communion. Amen. Think about this history of, in, in, you know, in 16th century England, the priest who, who you know, who who, tra- who went overseas and to the continent to, to become priests, then came back to England knowing, knowing full well they would be tortured and killed, almost guaranteed. And yet they did it. Why? Because they wanted to bring the sacraments to the people. They put their lives on the line for their physical health and, 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 and their life just so that they could bring the, 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 the sacraments to the people. That is what, I mean— you know, sometimes we, we get uh, we get sometimes I'll get criticized and others get criticized because we we put too much on the priest or the bishop. But I'm sorry, that is their role in the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Their role is a higher, more sacrificial role. I mean, obviously, if you and I, as parents, we know we, we sacrifice all the time for our kids. Well, they are called to sacrifice their entire lives to bring the sacraments to us. And and I know good priests who will do that. And they they put the they put the people first, but. It's just it's a scandal to me when I hear somebody say mm-hmm. that uh, because mm-hmm. it's just like no when you were ordained you were ordained to give your life for the people That's and right. if that means I'm not saying that you know if you have COVID if you know if you're sick and you go to mass and cough on the but yeah you you did something wrong right absolutely you absolutely oh, obviously let's let's use common sense here but if you're healthy and 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 you want to receive on the tongue without a mask on all that stuff right there you know you should be able to and there's no priest should deny you that and a priest if he's sick with covid or he's in, in some really health situation mm-hmm. yes i understand him being mm-hmm. uh maybe staying back but at the same time i hear stories of priests that will i know priests you know who are older and not not necessarily in the great health who who will they're like i'm going to the hospital i don't care i'm going to go and i'm going to reach out and i'm going to bring the sacraments because that's what i've been called to do and mm-hmm. that's that's the priest need today so there's that great Barrington Declaration, which was comprised of over 4,000 doctors. And what you're speaking of, Eric, I think, um, has the basis of that science. Yes, there are some who are in a profile group who are uh, are at risk, number one. Number two, you know, we find very little evidence that those who are asymptomatic spread it. Number three, um, 
you know, cloth masks, statistically negligible that they have any kind of effect whatsoever. Um, and so number four, let life go on. There are other factors besides just, if you will, the health and the heightened, overcharged, overhyped, uh, you know, portrait of that that has been at the expense of other fundamental health issues. But I want to kind of go back a second to discover the motive or discuss that motive, the motive for faith, the motive for Catholics, the motive to go to church, to go to mass. Because I think you indicated in the beginning um, that many going into churches, the McCarrick sort of iconic uh, woven into all that has been beige. Their experience has been beige. And I think it's accurate to say the question is, when we come into a church, do we believe in the manner, the heart, the perception of the priest in particular, start there, that he believes what he is saying, certainly in the liturgy of the Eucharist, but in the way in which Mass is done. Yes, the architecture and all that. Are we convinced that these are a people who fully are seeking to live and proclaim what is taking place at Mass? It's a standard for all of us. I mean, how many of us are really fully, actively, consciously participating? Number two, with a mask thing, you know, adoration literally means mouth to mouth. It's an intimate term. It's like that Matthew 7, many will come on my name saying, look at all these great things we did, heal the sick, raise the dead. Who wouldn't step back and say, that person's so holy. Wow, they raised people from the dead. But the Lord's words were, depart from me, I never knew you. That verb to know is a conjugal verb. Like this, this is about intimacy with God. And so the contrary of that, if you were Satan, you'd want to divide, you'd want to cut off that intimacy with God. You'd want to have people using words that bespeak of intimacy without it having the corresponding grace flowing from it. But with masks, in our opinion, they're an unnecessary obstruction to relational intimacy. Going into this place where we should experience hope, encouragement, faith. Um, yes, appropriate if, you know, expectorating or something. You know, you shouldn't be coming in the first place, which should be every disease you've ever had. But how can church become that place again? Maybe I'm speaking to priests that we walk into and we have confidence in the sovereignty of God, that he made us for himself, that he is the bread of life, that through with and in him we can discover this eternal life for which we're yearning. Someone just recently said to us today that they want to go to a church that worships in faith instead of their experience of one that worships in fear. And I just thought that summed it up so well. Eric? And I think also we have to remember that this is revealing underlying uh, ways of thinking and belief that existed well before COVID. Right. COVID, you know, the COVID response is not, it's not the, the, the cause, so to speak. It's more just revealing what was so already true. there. The fact that people were going through the motion, the fact that mass was just another thing on, on, the, on the checklist, and we already knew most Catholics weren't going to mass anyway. The fact that it was just another activity in our lives that was no different than going to your kid's uh, baseball game or going to, you know, the, the, the swim club or whatever. It, it, and because of that, then we treat it like that when it comes to our response to COVID. We don't look, we look at no mm-hmm. different than any other activity, and, and it really is fundamentally different. So true. Eric, I wouldn't be me if I didn't ask you a hardball question, put you on the spot, so I'm going to do that right now. If tomorrow Bishop Gomez said, Eric, we're flying you to wherever, and uh, you're going to have a room full of all the bishops in the United States, what would you say? Yikes. Um, okay, so I think, <laughs> Yikes. I think if that happened, I would I'd probably have two things I would say, because obviously, you know, you could, you, I could have, you know, a year and you never cover everything. But the two things I think I would say if I had a short amount of time with them, the first thing I would say is you need to all lead the church in repentance and mm. in and beg God's forgiveness hmm. for what we have allowed to happen. Wow. And I mean this literally, like, I think every single bishop should go in front of his cathedral in sackcloth and ashes, and I'm not being figurative, I'm being literal. Hmm. I honestly think every bishop should go in front of his cathedral and lead his people in confession to God that we have failed him, and that's why we have millions of babies being killed, we have men thinking they're women, it's okay, we have homosexual marriage and all these different things, is because the church we have failed miserably and from the top down but the top does have to lead and so that's that'd be the first thing i would say to them so good I, you have to lead us in that the second thing i would say and, and this is you know the one that may not have seen people like as much as i would say you need to do everything you can to make the traditional latin mass more available to people mm-hmm. and because i think it's been it's shown that young people they're, they're striving for that authentic worship and that is, you know, that has been a traditional way in which 
authentically God who's in worship and and make it more available. Don't make it where somebody has to go, uh, you know, has to go at three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, four hours to get to one. Mm -hmm. Make it where every, mm -hmm. you know, as many parishes as possible offer at least one. You know, make it where everybody was in, can, is within driving distance of a Sunday morning. Maybe you tell the parishes, okay, the first Mass of Sunday morning is your Latin Mass, and then, you know, whatever else. Just uh, something like that, because I really do think that that has proven to be uh, a concrete way in which people recognize uh, an authentic worship of God. Eric, I'm with you. It may surprise you to hear me say that. We've had conversations <laughs> over the years. You know, we, we do come from a family that has guitars and pianos, and we have played contemporary praise and worship. Just with Annie, our oldest, who will be 20... <laughs> She'll be 23. 23. Think. Yeah, sorry. Down at Ave, just the, the COVID regulations that they were placing on the churches down there on campus and nearby were utterly ridiculous. And so they, she and her fiancé sought out Latin Mass where they knew there weren't. They weren't like that and right. fell in complete love with it. And, um, That's great. Yeah, so just very, very beautiful. I'm, I'm sure I know a lot of people that have yeah. the Latin Mass there, uh, Sarasota. But the, the one down in Naples and, and Fort Myers, those are satellites of the one. Oh, that's okay. good. That's good. So. By the way, uh, Professor Nathan Schleter and Elizabeth will be on next week talking about uh, the Novus Ordo and Vatican II and all that. But anyway, staying focused. What's happened, though, is we lost... We lost the majesty, the transcendence, the wonder that formed souls to look at the world and to behold, if you will, with the heart and mind, the way God designed us. So comment on that a little bit, Eric, and how the Latin Mass, in your experience, the extraordinary form, I should say, how that forms us for beholding God in this fullness of our humanity created for Him. I think probably the most important aspect of worship from the, the human side, from our side, is authenticity, that we really are uh, offering ourselves to God in worship and sacrifice. And I believe the, the traditional Latin Mass, the extraordinary form of the Mass, it, it was developed over hundreds of years by the Church, and, and, and you know, it's time-tested. And it's seen as a great way, you know, the way the Church has for centuries, it led people in the worship of God. And I think one of the best things about the traditional Latin Mass, the extraordinary form, is the fact that it is much, it's very much built in vertically centered in the sense that you're, you're, you're looking up to God, you're not mm. looking horizontally between people, both literally and figuratively. And so I think that really gives that authentic nature, nature that you walk in, you know, okay, this is about God, this is not about me, this is not about entertaining people, this is not about trying to even keep their attention, frankly, one of the things that's nice about the the extraordinary form is they don't they don't care if the people are paying attention or not <laughs> you're, mm -hmm. because your your focus your eyes are on God. But the funny thing, what I found over the years is that, what I think is interesting is that it's the corollary of not focusing on the people makes it attractive to people. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's like when you try to make it attractive to people, it's like you're the you know if you're the awkward girl in high school and you want to get the, the attention of the uh, the high school quarterback, we do all these things to try to get his attention and you, you dress up and you put this gaudy makeup on and, and you do all these stupid things and he's just like whatever. But if you start to ignore him, all of a sudden now you become in a sense interesting to him in a way. And then it's not a perfect analogy, but the point is is that at mass the number one focus is the worship of God. It's not evangelization. In fact, that's not the purpose of the Mass. It's not evangelization. And I'm speaking to somebody who has been focused on evangelization for decades. Mm -hmm. It's not evangelization. But what happens is, is by that focus on God, people are attracted to that. They say, there's something in this world greater than me and my problems. There's something in this world greater than the problems of this country or whatever. There's something greater than all of us. And it points us in that direction. So I feel like that is the reason that I'm... Uh, a big advocate for the extraordinary form being uh, more normalized in the church and the more practice. I do think it helps lead people to a more authentic worship of, of the Almighty God. Fabulous. I do think that you're going to have an experience uh, in that Mass, if you've never been to it before, that's going to demand from you, from us, a level of patience, um, a level of um, enduring, 
um, because, again, it's not feeding the senses in the modernistic sensory sort of way. It is very sensory, I think, in in every way. God took on flesh, and the Mass clearly is an incarnation of that. Um, But it's a little bit of that Psalm 4610, be still and know that I'm God quality. I think it's a little bit of that when when we went to uh, Latin Mass, when was the most recent one, Steph? Uh, it was a wedding. wedding. Okay, mm-hmm. it was Anna's and uh, Justin. Justin, shout out to them. New professor at Ave Maria University, Professor Justin Bonanno. Anyways, um, we went to their wedding mass, and it was uh, new to mostly everybody. And I think without exception, it was longer. It did require patience. But I don't know if there's anybody from those who are regular mass goers as us to those who hadn't seen the inside of a church in years, the response was extremely positive. That um, we left more aware of who we are in God, that it forged something in us. It was not Kool-Aid. It was a, dare I say, a fine wine. Right. And I think a lot of the people I've talked to who have a negative impression of the Latin Mass, I think there's two two reasons. One is they associate with the bad old days of pre-Vatican II. And really, that's a, that's a fundamental misunderstanding how the church works to act like there was a before and after Vatican II in the sense of it's a fundamentally different entity. Um, and so that's one thing is they, they just associate with like these bad old days. They probably didn't even live during themselves. And then secondly, I do think there's a, a bad reputation among people who advocate for the traditional mass. Some of it deserved, some of it not deserved. Uh, you know, we're all we're all fallen, and, and we all sometimes get a little too enthusiastic about what we what we think is best, um, and we can cross lines of, of prudence when we do that. Um, and I acknowledge that in myself too. But I think so. I think people, are, but when they go. When they actually go to a, a traditional Latin Mass and they just sit there, they experience it, and they allow themselves to fall into the worship, I do think I always hear very positive responses. Um, and I'm talking about people who never gone before, mm. they didn't have any necessary expectations of what it would be like, uh, but they just came away like, okay, that really is uh, a, a, a beautiful way to worship God. And, and it, one thing I always, you know, a lot of times hear is people say, it just seems so Catholic. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Oozes Catholicism in a way that often our uh, many of our ordinary form masses don't always ooze Catholicism as much. And yes, they're Catholic, they're valid. I'm not trying to argue that. I'm just saying the 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 experience just in the Church of Mass. It's like you can't you know it's Catholic. I mean, it can't be anything else. <laughs> right, right. So two thoughts of quickly. Um, one, I think those people listening who are you know so in love with the Latin Mass. Um, just a little challenge. Somebody who also has great love and regard for it, but our parish is Novus Ordo, and we're blessed that it's prayed very beautifully. Um, but so often I hear some of these people who think that's the only way um, really look down upon anybody who would dare go to the Novus Ordo. So, you know, and it's not valid and it's not this and it's not that. So I guess a a greater sense Mm. of humility, and that's not the majority at all, but sometimes, like you said, you know, we're all fallen, but it just, those few people, you know, unfortunately really turn away. The same could be said about, you know, the charismatic movement in different forms of prayer, you know, not speaking of mass, but to really encompass all that is Catholic and all mm-hmm. that is true and all that is beautiful in its proper form. So just a little, uh, you know, Excellent. word in that Absolutely. realm. And I remember, I just have to share this too, my very first Latin Mass back in Erie, Pennsylvania, it was at the Carmelite Monastery and the, the bishop finally gave permission, this was probably back in the 80s, um, that it could be said. And my grandmother was so excited to go. So we went together and I was so taken, of course, by the reverence and the the quiet to be able to truly enter in and to pray. And then the other thing that stood out to me is they prayed the prayer to St. Michael afterwards. And I just thought, that is so cool and so appropriate. So we obviously we're blessed awesome. with that right now. By the way, Steph, we do have Ad Orientum Thursdays, which is kind of nice. Yeah, we do. Yeah, continuation we do. of our beloved pastor, Father Adam Hertzfeld, yeah. former and now awesome Monsignor Borger, new pastor. Um, Eric, I wanted to give you a chance to prior... Um, to our conversation, you had used the powerful analogy, I think, of the frog in the water. So I'm going to throw that at you and go with it. Yes, I feel like I, I feel like Catholics in this country, at least, are like the frog in the slowly boiling water. We don't realize that we're actually burning now. 
because for so long things have been moving against our faith in this country. And now we've reached a point where it should, it's not a political statement to say, like we, we ran an article in Crisis last week that the title was Joe Biden eats and drinks his own spiritual death. Mm. That wow. is not a political statement. Right. That is a statement of fact if you are a Catholic. Because of the fact that, that uh, President Biden, I'll say that, President Biden is uh, adamantly pro-abortion, believes in the uh, killing of innocent babies uh, being legalized and promoted and even paid for. And very, I mean, he, he also, he officiated at a quote-unquote gay marriage. Mm-hmm. All these things, he, he should not receive Holy Communion. That's just period. There's no real debate about that. There shouldn't be at least. But the fact that there is a debate, in my mind, shows the slow progress that uh, regress, I should say, against the church that has been made. And it goes back, you know, like we remember in the 1980s with uh, Governor Cuomo of uh, New York, New York. The, 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 the current one's dad, I think it is, um, when he first started really promoting this idea that you can be personally pro-life and, and, and uh, politically pro-choice, stuff like that. And the bishops and nobody really stood up to him then. And now we see we have a president who is doing this and bringing scandal. And so and, and also just the fact that inside the church and outside the church, these things have developed over time, and now we have less than 10% of Catholics go to Mass. We have a president of the United States who says he is Catholic, yet uh, promotes some of the most heinous and mm-hmm. immoral and terrible things on earth. We have, but, and we act like that's not, like that's normal. That is not normal. A Catholic who wakes up in the morning and thinks the way things are is normal needs to really recognize it's not. Now, that's not, I'm not saying that means we need to freak out every morning. Mm -hmm. What it means is we need to look to ourselves and say, okay, we need to go back to the basics, praying every day on a regular basis, going to Mass regularly, going to confession regularly, doing acts of charity regularly, you know, support, you know, being a good father, being a good mother, you know, all these things, we need to really recommit to those things. And then for some people, what is your calling outside of the family and outside of your own spiritual life? Are you called to, to go out and, and proclaim the gospel in some way in your own life um, that might end up working out not so good for you? Maybe you'll lose your job or something like that. But until we really step up, you know, the, the, it's not going to get any better. And so the reason I say we have to re- realize this is not normal is, is not to say we freak out, but instead to say we need to respond and we need to react to that in a way that it draws us. It's a call to holiness is what it is. Because it's, it's the saints that always overcome the crises in the church. And St. Jose Maria <clears throat> said that, it, it, you know, the crises today is a crisis of saints. We need more right. things. And encapsulating, thank you for that, Eric. Catechism 2 one, 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 very easy to remember. The heart of it is that if we're not attentive to the dispositions at the heart of disciplines, it's superstition. I'll say it again. If we're not attentive to the dispositions, that inner life, at the heart of these disciplines, it's superstition. And I think we are, <clears throat> if you will, in our circumstances being forged to more fully kind of live internally, externally, what we profess to believe. And uh, I might suggest and invite you to jump on board, you know, what is the word then to parents? Shift into the gear that parents are the primary school of formation for eternal life, for making saints. Uh, John Paul II said, the future of humanity passes by way of the family. That, you know, mom and dad, what's the first thing we can do? Well, you know, I would certainly say, you know, be more deeply converted. You know, the repentance theme, certainly. What are ways that we have been living selfishly, living our own lives, trying to moderate and delegate our primary call to form our kids to the systems around us? I think most parents have experienced, you know, in the COVID crisis and when their kids were home, came in confrontation with their own vice. They encountered these kids that they were away from for eight hours a day, and suddenly they're in their home. And hopefully that aha went off of, oh, like, I'm responsible for them more than Sister Delores or whatever. You know, I'm the one, we are the ones who are responsible for forging them for eternal life. And then that begs the question, am I giving them a compelling witness of what it means to be a son or daughter of God in Jesus Christ? Yeah, and I, I was, something that's been on my heart that really came from my wife, um, who, whom you know very well as well, she, she really saw the COVID crisis as a way to reevaluate what we do with our kids, particularly what we do, the activities we do, 
the ways we, we interact with the rest of the world, and the way we build them up and raise them. And I think one of the, the big things is we realize that we shouldn't look at our, 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 our structured, scheduled activities as the end-all, be-all that we'll do no matter what. So, for example, mm-hmm. um, I, I'll say this. Um, my girls, my younger girls were in a, a scout group. That was great for them. We loved it. Catholics ran it and all that. But then this year they instituted a ton of these COVID rules where, you know, young girls who were maybe seven years old had to wear masks that sit, sit six feet apart and, and all this stuff. And it was just crazy. And Come join us. Like that's not a healthy way right. for a child to interact with her friends. And so we just, it, but it's something we really valued, that group. And so, but we decided, no, we're just not going to do it. But what we did was we didn't just say we're going to pack up our toys and leave. We found other parents who had similar feelings. Mm-hmm. And so now what they do is they do their own park day. They go out to the park. They play out, outside. I mean, even in the cold, we live in great. Ohio too. Um, they, they go to the park. They play at the creek. They, they run around. They do things like that with their friends. And, and it's mostly unstructured, just being with other good, good kids and, and hanging out and stuff like that. And, but being normal, the real normal of just interacting with other people and learning how to uh, learn from them and, and develop and, and charity and all those things. And I feel like that's something that we as parents, all of us, we need to do is say, okay, are, are these things we've been doing, do we have to do them? Is it, is it worthwhile to still do them even if we have to change all this stuff? And look to say, what can we do in our own homes? Mm-hmm. Like, for example, if you have a, a, a house and maybe a property that's still a little more land or something like that, maybe you could be a place where people can come over and the kids can play out in the yard or something like that instead of saying, okay, we have to drop them off at the church or mm-hmm. drop them off at, at, the, at the school or something like that. But make yourself your, your own place. And, and to be practical, you're more likely to be able to, to, to do things the way you want to do them rather than having to conform to rules that, you know, like a six-year-old girl wearing a mask is completely pointless. Um, so things like that. So I, that's where I really see it as parents um, in, in this age we're in is to really adapt to what the age we're in and, and figure out ways to live out the faith that may not be the standard ways we've been doing it in the past. That's awesome. And I, I appreciate this conversation. Folks, you're tuning in Ignite Radio Live over the five mighty stations of Annunciation Radio. We have Eric Sammons with us. He is the new editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine, author. Also, you can find out uh, his work and books at ericsammons.com, E-R-I-C-S-A-M-M-O-N-S.com. Eric, just as we're kind of coming in for a landing here, you've just given us for those who may be just tuning in and listen, want to listen to the podcast, okay. I encourage you to go to IgniteRadioLive.com. We've had a number of phenomenal programs over recent weeks that really discuss, unveil the edgy conversations we need to be having. So Eric, as you've assumed the helm of Crisis Magazine, what do you have in store? What's the vision five years from now? I really would like Crisis to do two things. One is to reveal and make sure Catholics understand the current crisis in both the church and the culture. Mm-hmm. But I also think that alone is not good enough. I, I really want to focus on practical ways in which Catholics can respond to the crisis. What nice. can we actually do? Because I do think sometimes we get a little too tied up in just saying the bad things going on. We need to say, what can we do? So I'm hoping that through both the, the website, but also I'm, I'm going to start up a, a podcast with crisis. Mm. We're going to do different ways to really reach out and, and, and tell people, what, what can we do in response to this crisis? And, and ultimately, as I said earlier, it's we need to become saints. Mm -hmm. But what practical steps we can take in in these cases, like how do we respond to a a so-called Catholic president uh, who who supports abortion? How do we uh, respond to our local communities uh, doing anti-Catholic things and stuff like that? So that's what I'm hoping for, um, for for crisis. Fabulous. Folks, just to whet your appetite a little bit at crisismagazine.com, I'll read just uh, maybe the, the most recent six titles, the current one, Standing Up to the LGBT Anti-Bullying Bullies by Eric Sammons here, our guest. Number two, The Cost of Crushing Human Community by Michelle McLoon. One Mass, One People by our friend Robert Grieving. Steph, do you remember him? He was at a, in Erie, Pennsylvania for a while. Do Humans Dream of Electric Empathy? One Senior Richard Antal. Kupich Gomez Spat Reveals Divide in the USCCB is another title. And I'll just read one more. Uh, Biden, the Bishops, and the New Face of Catholicism. Very interesting. So some very well 
uh, written articles that I think tap kind of, if you will, the essence of key issues that we need to be familiar with, and uh, hopefully will orient us all together to the heart of the Father, seeking to not simply pray the Lord's Prayer, but be instruments of the kingdom. Eric, any final thoughts? Is there anything burning that we didn't address that you would just like to impart to our audience today? I would just really say Catholics don't accept the status quo. Don't accept being like the culture. Be as countercultural as possible. Our culture is a culture of death. And Catholics, we believe in the gospel of life. So be countercultural. Amen. Folks, so blessed that you've been with us tonight in this very consequential conversation. Again, if you want to hear some very compelling past episodes, go to IgniteRadioLive.com and uh, also sign up uh, for our newsletter. We've been kicking out on a weekly basis very moving short stories of people in our community. We've been asking the question, what is a, a testimony to God's presence in our lives? Do we not need good news? We're on our eighth story, so... Um, Go there to massimpact.us and you can see the sign up form to get that regular update. And just a bit of a commercial as we're closing in on Lent. Steph, can you believe that? Lent is right around the corner. Well, there's nothing around us, what we read in the papers or here on TV, nothing around us that surpasses what God wants to do with us and within us. We encourage you to seize that opportunity on a weekly basis to bring your family together for a meaningful time of encountering Him and talking and praying. We provide all that you need. Go to ilovemyfamily.us and that in your home, God wants to do great things. So lean past your awkwardness, your doubts, your fears. Set that time up this week and discover the power of God alive in your family. Again, using the Live It Gathering Guide. Find out more at ilovemyfamily.us. So blessed to be on this journey of building the kingdom for such a time as this we remain. God bless you. Away my soul.